don't forget, <coughs> when we're, we're finished, we've got a bottle of uh, disinfectant, a glove, and a uh, cloth, and I would like you just to wipe down just the metal part of your chair uh, to comply with the uh, government regulations. Also, uh, please do wear a mask. There's masks at the back of the church. And um, use a disinfectant on your hands. Now, tonight, I'm going to be preaching on Bethlehem. I, if you're watching online, and I'd encourage you to be here in person. It's going to be a helpful I did not realize this, but I have preached, I think it's Micah 5.2, but thou Bethlehem, is that Micah 5.2? Okay, but thou Bethlehem, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come. That's it. Well, I have, uh, well, I won't get there. Uh, I have actually preached on that verse four times previous to this. I had never realized it, but uh, this is going to be a completely different sermon, and we're going to be looking at uh, Bethlehem. Bethlehem means what? House of bread. Ephrata means bountiful. And we're going to look at that, uh, so I'd encourage you to come. Sunday morning, we're going to have a Christmas Day uh, service. Uh, I'd encourage you to come and worship the Lord. Uh, for those people watching online that do come to church but haven't been coming for a while, I would encourage you very much to come. Uh, on Friday? Friday, yeah, that's the 25th, isn't it? Yep. The 25th, Christmas Day. Then today uh, is the offering for tracks. Uh, Sorry, for, for uh, advertising. If you're not here, and you, you can do it online. And if you don't have the church's details, let me know. Um, pray for our Facebook page. And uh, if you're... Now, I know there's people in the church that watch online, but if you're a visitor watching online and you don't uh, uh, have a Bible, we'd love to send you one free. We would pay for the shipping and the Bible. Or if you're interested in a, a, a Bible study, let me know. And uh, just email me, Pastor Lionel Smith at Outlook.com. At this time, we are going to take our Bibles and we're going to turn back to our <clears throat> text verse, but we're going to cover a bit more than that. So let's stand together and we're going to read um, Hebrews chapter 10 and we'll ver read verses. Uh, um, 22 to 25. Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the, your precious word. I pray that you would bless it. I pray that we would learn and grow and be challenged from your word. And I ask in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Each year we have a theme. One second here. And our theme this year is Be Faithful to the Faith. We don't have our banners up because we have our Christmas banners, which I think look lovely and help us to remember Christmas. But uh, Be Faithful to the Faith. And Sam uh, um, picked out a number of verses for us each month, a, a new verse. And I didn't review all the verses that uh, we memorized, but these verses are good for us to remind us that God looks for faithfulness. And uh, so I'm not going to review the sermons, but uh, we were to be faithful by drawing near to God. Let us draw near. God wants us to get closer to him. He says, draw nigh unto me and I will draw nigh unto thee. And if you, uh, it's up on YouTube if you want to watch that. Then we're to, draw, uh, to be faithful by holding fast. 
And uh, we're just to keep going. And now uh, we're to be faithfully considering one another. That's my uh, topic, uh, uh, sorry, my title for the uh, uh, sermon this morning, Be Faithful uh, to One Another, or Let Us Be Faithful Because God is Faithful. Uh, let us consider one another. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, 24, sorry. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We're to consider one another. Well, consider means to, to think on with care, uh, uh, to be think carefully with respect. Now, it's interesting. Uh, I, before, um, in previous sermon, I went through a uh, number of times it says, let us, in the book of Hebrews. Consider is mentioned four times. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. And these three are all to consider Jesus Christ. The ones we're going to look at. And the fourth is consider one another. Hebrews 3, verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Interesting. Uh, so it talks about how uh, Jesus Christ, and we're to, to consider it, that Jesus Christ was faithful. He was faithful in everything he did. He was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. People think uh, often that the... Uh, only time Jesus was tempted was in the wilderness. No, that was a great temptation because uh, 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 he was so weak after fasting and praying. But he was, he was tempted in his whole life. In all points like as we are. Not, not every, like he wasn't tempted to take heroin because heroin wasn't there then. But he was tempted in all areas. So to take, uh, to take uh, that type of thing... Uh, alcohol or, or uh, lust or greed or envy or jealousy, all those temptations. But he was faithful, and we're supposed to consider that. Then in Hebrews chapter 7, in verse 4, Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Now here we're talking about uh, uh, chapter 7, Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a very interesting person. He was the king of Salem. Anybody remember what Salem means? Peace. Peace. And it's part of, of Jerusalem. So this, uh, it tells us in verse 2, that's why I stopped at verse 1, because it tells us in verse 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being first by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of of peace. So we're to consider uh, this man that tithed. He gave a tenth of all, uh, sorry, he was tithed too. Abraham gave a tenth of all he had to him. Now, it was, in my belief, this was a Christophany. A Christophany is an appearance of Jesus Christ before the incarnation. The incarnation is God the Son coming to earth to become a man. But many times he, he appeared before that in the form of a man. Abraham, he appeared to him. Uh, just uh, many times. Uh, Joshua and, and various, some people don't agree with me, but that's fine. But it's definitely talking, if, he, if it wasn't incarnation, he was a very, very... Uh, um, type or picture of Jesus Christ, but I believe it was Jesus Christ in the flesh. And then Hebrews 12, verse 3. Well, verse 2 and 3. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured cuts such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. So we're, we're, uh, we're um, to consider Jesus Christ. And, and three times uh, we're told uh, in the book of Hebrews to consider Jesus Christ and, 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 and what he suffered and how he was faithful. Uh, 
And then it says, now in chapter 10, verse 24, we're to consider one another. In the same way that you're to consider Christ, you're supposed to consider one another because Christ dwells in me. And if you're saved, Christ dwells in you. And so we should have that consideration of the Christians. And I'm going to co cover this later in this sermon, but a big point of being considerate of the brethren is being faithful to church. If you don't faithfully attend church, you're not considering God, you're not considering his command, you're not considering your brothers and sisters in Christ. God is the one, as we're going to say, uh, warns us not to forsake the assembling. And so uh, I would say we need to assemble. It's so easy to get hooked on so-called internet church. But God didn't design it that way. And I'll talk about this later. But we're, we're to, to gather the assemble yourselves together. Well, I can't assemble. Assemble means to get together without getting together. So we're to consider one another. You know, God is asking us to live the life of the new nature in Christ. That is, let Christ live through us so that we can consider one another. We're to consider them. Uh, I, I'm consider their, uh, uh, their needs. My old nature says, consider myself, consider my comforts, consider my feelings, consider... But God's saying, go above those natural things and put others first. That, that's letting the Holy Spirit work through us. I'm to consider every single person. He, uh, Philippians, you don't need to turn there. I have it actually in my notes. But Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be do, done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem utter other better themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things that of others. We're to consider others and the others' needs. And it, it, it's so, so important that we consider the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And let us consider one another. Every single person is important. And I'm to consider you and you're to consider me. We're to consider those that are younger in the Lord. We're to consider those that are old in the Lord. We're to consider the pastor. Uh, the Bible says, Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, that the, as that as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. So we need to gather together so that we can consider one another. Uh, I, it's very hard to, to keep track of people if you don't meet together. It's so important. And uh, I need to consider other, other people's trials and, and, and testing. And maybe you're uh, watching online and you don't be faithful to church. But how do we know how we can be a blessing to you? It, it's so hard. And so uh, it's important. I need to consider people. I, I need to think, how can I be a blessing to the people? And so part of that consideration is to provoke. Now we always, I should say we always, I tend to think of provoke as being like something to, to get somebody riled up, you know? If I go and pull Sam's beard, I think he, that would be provoking him. But this is not to provoke to do to bad, but to provoke unto good. To, 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 to call into action, to arouse, to excite somebody for the right things. And I, I'm excited uh, about God. And I'm excited to come to church uh, to, to learn of God. And you know, you, you'd be surprised at this, but even through the preaching of the Word of God, when I'm preaching, God convicts me, God challenges me, God encourages me. Because it's from God. And uh, it's exciting. And, but when you're not in church, you're not exciting others to be excited about God. Um, it's wonderful to be a blessing to, to others, we, to, to, uh, to encourage them. We all need to be stirred up. We react to stimuli. Uh, if we touch something hot, we, we pull away. Uh, yesterday... We had the fire, we run the fire every day. And uh, I was cleaning out in the morning and I thought the fire had been long since dead and I cleaned it out and 
piece of coal popped out. And so I went to pick it up and I dropped it. It was still hot, it burnt my finger. But the point is, uh, there is a reaction to a stimulus. And that's the same thing with Christians. We react to things. You may not think, oh, it's not that important. I, I don't know uh, any uh, soccer fans here, but I thought, thought this was really interesting. You know, they're, they're, they're playing without fans. And the, the Premier League in, in uh, England is, is going to set a record for most away wins. Generally speaking, 61% of the uh, matches in the uh, Premier League are, are won by home team. You know, home team advantage, we've all heard that. I mean, why, why is it in rugby we do so good at home and we can lose away? Because there's an advantage of people saying, come on, you can do it, come on, come on. Well, this year, only 33, uh, sorry, 61% of the matches are, going, are won by the away team compared to uh, 33%. So there's 100% more wins away this year because there's no fans cheering them on. And it's interesting, uh, you can provoke people to do well. And what's very interesting is without the fans, it seems that it's a discouragement to the team. So when you come to church, you are stimulating me or provoking me to do the right things. You're like a, a, a fan saying, come on, Christian, you can do it. Come on, Christian, you can do it. Come on, come on. And, and we all like encouragement. But you can't encourage somebody if you're not here. If you are faithful, church, you're, 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 if you're not faithful, you're actually a discouragement rather than encouraging. You're telling people church doesn't matter. I want to read you a quote. The tech tactically declares that we can incite one another. That men may provoke each other to evil and to hatred is a fact universally known. But the power to incite and susceptibility of being excited are really capacities for good as for evil. The electric telegraph can produce, convey truth and falsehood, evil and good report, and human influence may awake human sympathy and arouse purpose and will for fighting for right and for wrong. So uh, it's saying that we can in, in, encourage ourselves and, and others, or we can discourage others. Uh, Paul told Timothy, he said, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. He says, Timothy, you be the example so that others can follow you. So the question is, is my life such a life that is provoking people to the right thing? I'm to provoke them unto love. Get a bit dry there. I provoke people to love by showing people love. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Understand this, showing God's love, how is it that they, they, they had this work and labor of love? They ministered to the saints and did do minister. The saint is somebody that's made holy. Somebody that's been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Somebody that's been born again. And he said, this, uh, the Lord said, you've got this labor of love. And, and how do you do it? By looking after the saints. I'm, I'm to provoke unto love and to good works. So how can I provoke? Well, I can say, how are you doing today? I'm praying for you I'm, and, and trying to encourage one another. Show love. It's very hard to, to show love without 
being near somebody. I, I uh, phoned my dad, and you know, it's, it's one thing to talk to him, but he's, he, he's halfway across the world almost. And I, I long to see him because I can show him my love. The church of Corinth was a bad example in many things. But turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. They were a good example in one thing. That example of giving. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Get there. Verses 1 and 2. For as touching the ministering to the saints... It is superfluous for me, to write unto you, for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Paul said, the zeal of the, the Corinthian people hath provoked very many. Under what? Under love. They were giving to, to, to help others out. And we need each other so that we can show love to one another. Uh, and when, I, when you show me love, that provokes me to show other people love. And when I show you love, that provokes you to show other people love. We are not to, to stand alone as, as a, a single tree in a field. I don't know if you've ever seen a, a tree just sitting by itself in a field and, and it's often just, uh, you can see the, 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 the leaves are all going one way where, uh, where they've been bent by the wind. But we're kind of like the giant sequoia trees. They're the redwood trees. They're the largest trees on earth. And uh, they can be like uh, almost 100 meters high and, and uh, 10 10 meters in diameter. They're just huge trees. And did you know that, that, that some of them are actually older than they came, they were alive before Jesus Christ came in the flesh? Huge trees. And the, the largest specimen is the General Sherman tree in the Sequoia National Park. It's 84 meters high and has a diameter of 11 meters at the base. And it's estimated to weigh 2,500 metric tons. Now, the fascinating thing about the sequoia is this. They're a huge tree. H how deep would you think their roots would go? Less than three meters. Between two and, and, and two and a half meters. A, th a, a, a tree, a hundred meters tall, only has a very, very, and, and it's unbelievable, shallow roots. There, there's no uh, uh, tape root that goes down. Yet they survived f fires, violent storms, fierce winds. Why don't they fall over? They rarely do fall over. Well, it's because this. They survive because they live in groves. And the tree, roots of one tree, get into another tree and another tree, and, 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 and they're, all their roots are intertwined. So that when the wind blows, it may be blowing hard on one tree, but the others are holding it up. They cannot survive on their own. On their own, they will fall down because the winds are, are, are furious. We need each other. We need each other. We are like the, the, the giant redwoods. We weren't designed to be by ourselves. We are designed to have fellowship, to, be, to provoke one another unto love and to good works. I encourage you to do good for works for the glory of God, and you encourage me. You see, our, we're, the Bible says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So, by provoking you to, to, to good works, I am glorifying God. You encourage me to do good works. I am glorifying God. And, and I forgot to say in, in announcements, please take some tracks 
from the table. We've got Christmas tracks. Uh, I'm going to provoke you. Get out there. Do a couple of estates, three or four estates this week. As people need to know the good news of Jesus Christ. And so I'm provoking you here to good works. Remember, you are saved to serve. Titus 2.14, talking about Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. My calling is to serve God. And your calling is to serve God. Once you got saved, you're saved to serve. And sometimes we, we, we forget about that. But by being gathered together, we can provoke one another. I, I can say, you know, I had a really good chat with this person about the Lord. And when, when uh, I do that, maybe you think, maybe God says, oh man, you, you need to witness more often. Or maybe you say, well, I had a good witness and that convicts me. We provoke one another to love and to good works. So ask yourself, am I at church faithfully every week provoking people to love and to good works? Or am I discouraging them? And God says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, verse 24, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, <coughs> excuse me, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We're not to forsake. Forsake means to abandon or to quit or no longer do it. And God warns, and I'm not going to get into this, but uh, he gives us these three uh, let us, let us draw near, let us hold fast, and let us consider one another. And then he gives us a very, very strong warning in verse 26 and 27. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. But a certain fearful looking of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall, be, which shall devour our adversaries. And he continues... Uh, on he that despised Moses law died without mercy under the under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who have trodden under foot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace I'm not going to preach on that but it, it, that warning is there and uh, I want to read you a quote about it Pink says, we have now reached one of the most solemn, solemn and fear-inspiring passages to be found, not only in this epistle, but in all the word of God. May the Holy Spirit teach each of our hearts to approach that in godly trembling, which will become those that have within their hearts the seeds of apostasy. Let it be duly considered at the outset that this verse that the verses which we are now before us were addressed not to those who made no profession of being genuine Christians, but instead unto them whom the Spirit of truth, known as holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Nevertheless, he now dehorts them. Dehort is kind of like a negative uh, exhort. Exhort is to, to challenge forward and, and is kind of like warning here. Uh, nevertheless, he dehorts them from stepping over the brink of that awful precipice which was before them, and faithfully warns them of the certain destruction which follow, which would follow did they so. See, church is a called out assembly. And most people teach that means like called out of the world to live a holy life. It's far, far more than that. We're called out of our homes. We're called out of everything to come to church. It's the called out assembly. It means God said, I have designed this for you. We don't, uh, we don't let children live by themselves, do we? They need parents, right? God designed the family because he knows we need parents and, and, and training for so long. God has designed the church for us. And we, sadly, people are forsaking it these days. We need to faithfully attend the Bible preaching, Bible uh, 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 believing church. We need to meet together so that we can worship together. Uh, let me read you a quote. Uh, the Lord has promised that unanimous prayers of worshipers shall be answered and that he himself will meet with them, Matthew 18, 19, and 20. In such assemblies of believers... Devotion or holy feeling pass from heart to heart until all hearts are aglow. Mutual prayer strengthens the weak disciple. 
One man is cast down, almost faithless, but his invigorated, but his faith is invigorated and his soul encouraged by the influence of another who is believing and hopeful. We encourage one another. Uh, I, I am so thankful for each person here because you're an encouragement to me. And we need to uh, assemble together so we can pray together, so that we can uh, praise God together, so we can be what he wants us to be. So, uh, so you can hear the re preaching of the word. The Bible says, preach the word. Be instant, out, in season, out of season. Uh, we're commanded uh, to, to uh, be faithful. And then he says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembly ourselves together, as the manner of some is. Some people had just quit coming to church, and he says, this, that's not right. We shouldn't be like that. Maybe they quit coming because of lack of zeal. Maybe they quit coming because of persecution. We saw that. Maybe they quit coming because they were looking to somebody, and, and that person quit coming. And because that quit, person quit coming, then they don't stop coming. Uh, uh, maybe uh, they quit coming because they've lost their first love. Maybe they quit coming because of false teaching. I, I know somebody said to me, uh, uh, I, I can't go to church because I have to wear a mask. Well, God never commanded you not to wear a mask, but God did command you not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together uh, as the manner of some is. God's commands don't contradict. So we need to, to, uh, to consider one another. And it's interesting um, Verse 24 and verse 25 uh, were to exhort in, in verse 25 and were to provoke in 24. So both uh, have us encouraging, strengthening uh, each other. It is so important. And he says, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. I believe that this has a twofold meaning. And often in scripture, uh, you have a twofold uh, prophecy. It could be the near future and then a far off thing. And uh, Dr. Strauss puts it this way. The nature of biblical prophecy often included open, immediate, and remote aspects of coming judgment. And I think that's exactly what's happening here. The day approaching. Well, the day approaching... What's the near aspect? Anybody know of, of judgment in Hebrews? Okay, who is Hebrews written to? Jews, where? Jerusalem. So what is the near coming problem? It's going to happen to Jerusalem and say, this is maybe written, uh, I'm not sure when it was written, I'm going to say maybe... 60 A.D. roughly. I don't remember. Destruction of Jerusalem. That's the near uh, thing coming and then uh, could be the tribulation period as well. But they, they, they said, uh, they were, sorry, God said they were getting closer to troubles. We need one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I I read, and I, I'm, I am not worried about what's happening in the future, but I am concerned. And I just read uh, this morning about some things that concern me. And uh, it says to me that the Lord's coming, is coming soon. And I need encouragement now more than ever. I don't know about you, but uh, this uh, lockdowns, they they they. They affect me. I mean, I don't like it. Uh, I'm not somebody that is just so outgoing that has to have people around them all the time, but I, I do need the people around me. And we need one another. And the closer we come to the Lord's coming, and I do believe uh, the things I read about, I, I think the Lord's coming is very, very soon. Well, if that's the case, and if you believe that, you need to be even more faithful. Let me read you a quote. They whose custom it is was to forsake the assembling of the Christians were not yet apostates from the Christian faith and confession, 
But the admonition and exhortation of the text suggests that they were in danger of apostasy. And where awful warnings which immediately follow are more plainly indicate the dread peril. He who neglects the Christian assembly is likely ere long to forsake the Christian church and renounce the Christian faith. And I thought that was so true. I have seen that in my own life. Uh, people stop coming to church. Oh yeah, I'm still a good Christian pastor. I'm still on for the Lord. And pretty soon they stop coming entirely and then they're not even living for God. Why? Because it's a direct, um, it's a direct disobedience to the word of God. Now, I didn't choose these verses. They, they were actually chosen for me. But I'm going to say, if you're watching online, come to church in person. It is so, so important. I need it and you need it. God says, I need it. God says, you need it. It's not what I'm saying. It's what God's saying. And God says, let us consider one another. If you're not coming to church, it's because you're not considering what God says as a command. And you're not considering that one another are important. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Let us be faithful to the faith. Maybe you're watching online and you've never even been saved. You've never been born again. I remember hearing about that, and, and, and like Nicodemus, what in the world are you talking about? And my brother showed me from the Bible, quoting scripture, that I was a sinner and deserved judgment. I deserved to die and go to hell for my sins. And for the first time in my life, somebody had confronted me with my own sin. And I knew I was a wicked young man. And I knew if I got what I deserved, I would die and go to hell. But then he told me the good news that Jesus Christ died for me. And he explained that. I, I said, how can one man die for Another man, he explained me how he was God the Son. And when he came to earth, he lived a perfect life so that he could die in my place. And so finally I said to him, well, how do you get saved? And he said, just ask. And so I did. If you're watching online and you want to know how to be saved, contact me and I'll show you from the Bible how you can be saved. Each one of us, let's provoke one another unto love and good works. Let's encourage one another. And I'm thankful for you here. you're here because you encourage me. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you that we are able to gather together. I pray, Lord, that the, the government would continue to see how important churches are for our mental health and our well-being. And I pray, Lord, that uh, these challenges, I, I wouldn't have picked these verses myself, but it was obvious that you had it for such a time as this. And Sam picked these verses before even the, the start of the year. And so, Lord, we need to be encouraged. And I pray that these verses would encourage us to be faithful to church, to every service, and, that we, and so much the more as we see that day approaching. Even, Lord, even so, Lord, come quickly. We long to, for our Lord and Savior to come. And so I pray that we would be faithful till then. We ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming.